Yes, it's a great pleasure to be here. Brilliant program. Um, <coughs> two tough, tough talks that want to do. Uh, two tough talks to follow. I'm um, very interested to hear about old <coughs> and especially I'm very interested to hear about um, Bill Ayers to talk about bottlenecks. You know so much about bottlenecks. <laughs> <laughs> So well, I'm going to talk about uh, tipping points in the biosphere and how we might predict the unpredictable. So Mark gave this lovely talk, actually, um, I'm going to talk more to him about this afterwards, about how you can use the past record to get some idea of the sensitivity of the climate system. I'm going to try and convince you that we've um, also got an opportunity to use short-term variability that we can observe now to try and constrain uh, what you might call Earth system sensitivities. So this is the idea that the noise that we normally kind of try to average out to get the signal is actually telling us the sensitivity. And it's related to the notion that there are tipping points in the system. And I'll give you a couple of definitions, and I'll try and demonstrate something. Um, uh, so this is one from a paper by Tim Lenton that's been quite influential. Uh, and he describes the tipping point, uh, say in the climate system and the Earth system, is the critical point at which the future state of the system can be switched into a qualitatively different state by small perturbation. It's basically saying the state that we're in now uh, is it becomes unstable and you flip to a new state. And there's something similar in the um, report on the abrupt on abrupt climate change from the National Academy of Sciences in the US. Uh, it describes when the climate system is forced to cross some threshold, triggering a transition to a new state at a rate determined by the climate system itself <coughs> and faster than the cause. So that's all a bit technical. I'm going to try and do this with a chair. Okay, so um, it, I've been in the math department, I've been doing too many equations, so let's just do a chair. So if we imagine that the, uh, the state of the system is now like this, like this chair, it sort of sustains me, supports me. The idea with a tipping point is there's another state of the system. If we push this a little way, it'll come back, push it too far. If it goes to a new state, it's actually a stable state. Um, it's not so comfortable. Um, I'm not going to demonstrate that. And it actually takes energy, quite a lot of energy, to get the system back to the other stable state we're going to be in. So the notion is that um, lots of part of the climate system, especially those associated with ecosystems, has two states. And if we push the system too far, we might end up in a totally different state. It's reasonably stable, and it might stay there and be, un be unsafe. Um, so that's the, uh, uh, the chair explanation. Okay, now um, many tipping points have been identified in the climate system, and more and more are being identified. Some of these are based on past paleoclimate evidence, like the stuff Mark showed. Some are based on model uh, projections for the future. Many of these are actually associated with biosphere climate interactions. So I'm just going to highlight a few. Boreal forest dieback has been suggested. Permafrost loss, we saw evidence of that in the past record. Tropical forest dieback, which I'm going to talk to you about um, most in this talk and evidence that this higher was green in the past, and some suggestion it could be green in the future. So tipping points are abrupt changes, difficult to adapt to, but they needn't always be damaging. In fact, some of the tipping points we would like, uh, say in the social systems and the energy systems, are things that we would like to occur. So we needn't always imagine that these strong non-linearities are bad news, just someone we don't want. Okay, so let's think a bit about how you might predict a tipping point. And because I know Sue's going to bully me off in 25 minutes, I'm going to give you my conclusions as I go through. <laughs> Here's the first one. This is the first one. Tipping points are potentially abrupt and or irreversible changes in the climate system, and many are associated with ecosystem climate feedbacks. This is the, the tipping point, um, or evidence of the tipping point, associated with the transition of the Sahara from a green state, West Sahara, into an arid <coughs> desert state, rather abrupt transition. This is the uh, slide from Martin Schiffer. So what's on the uh, y-axis here is actually inverted. This is dust, so basically high dust, low dust. Telling us something about the vegetation state. So about five and a half thousand years ago, in the mid-Holocene, the West Sahara went from being green to being arid. Okay. And what Martin Schiffer asked is, well, if you're a hippopotamus, and arguably I'm fairly close. Um, <laughs> then how would you know at this point that you're about to undergo an abrupt change? You can't do it through the trend. The trend is really weak here. You know, you, can't, you really couldn't extrapolate this trend and end up with, with this. Okay, so you need something else. Um, it turns out that even though 
fundamentally tipping points will be difficult to predict from first principles, they will possibly give themselves away by the variability in the system. So if we just look back at this again, you might notice here that there's some evidence that the variability has changed. The trend is, is not clearly different, but the variability has changed. And the reason that happens is because when you... Um, uh, this is a slightly complicated diagram. But imagine you're forcing the system. In this case, it was the sun changing from, say, 6,000 years ago to 5,000 years ago. We might be in a single-state system here, identified by the ball at the bottom of a well. And when the system approaches a tipping point, it's as if the landscape's changing. In fact, what happens is that the well that the ball is in becomes shallower and shallower before the system basically rolls into a new state, tips into a new state. What that means is that, imagine the ball was getting pinged every so often by noise in the system. The noise here would be different from the noise here. In fact, by the time you got to this point, the system would get, undergo very long excursions that are very slow. This is actually called critical slowing down. So there's just a chance that even though predicting the first principles would be difficult, you might detect the change in this well by the noise in the system. So imagine that we had that chair again of approaching its tipping point, and it was just oscillating around. The oscillations would change just before the system was about to tip to a new state. Okay, and that's uh, really quite exciting, because it means the most important changes in systems might be not, much, not so much predictable, but they may provide a forewarning they're coming. Arguably long enough that we can do something about it, at least so we might be ready. Okay, so basically what happens is as the system approaches tipping point, the restoring force <coughs> towards the current state gets weaker and weaker, such that normal oscillations get longer and slower. It's like the spring pulling the system back to its equilibrium state gets weak. Okay. So we're able to get four warning of tipping points. <laughs> so there's my second point. Tipping points are very difficult to predict from first principles, but we may get a full warning of changes in variability prior to the tipping. The really weird thing is, or well, the ironic thing is, that um, until now, climate science has been kind of averaging out this variability, assuming it was hiding the signal. It might be the thing that contains the clue to sensitivity. This morning. There's also some stuff from physics I'm just beginning to learn about. I was actually trained as a physicist, but I'm only beginning to learn physics now. Um, there's a thing called the fluctuation dissipation theorem that's actually is in, rather rigorously used in statistical physics. It relates the variability of a system to its sensitivity to external forces. Okay. Uh, so it's a general result in statistical thermodynamics, but it actually applies to all sorts of systems where you can imagine them in an equilibrium state and where those oscillations are out of state tell you about how close you are from the system becoming suddenly on in a flat landscape where it's going to tip. Okay, and so we're going to apply these ideas to the Amazon tipping point. Okay. We're going to look specifically for what are being called now emergent constraints. That is robust relations between Earth system sensitivities. So in this case, we're going to look at how sensitive the tropics are to climate change and uh, uh, <coughs> Earth system sensitive to anthropogenic forcing and observable features of variability. So basically, we're going to look for things where the record we've already got tells us what we need to know. We don't have to wait for the sensitive to emerge where the variability will tell us. And we're going to look at the ensemble of current climate columns that wants to do that. Okay, here's, a, here's an example that's not related to the Amazon, but is a kind of motivating thing for me. This is from a paper Hall and Q in 2006. This, these are all the models from the last IPCC report. This is how large they predicted the snow albedo feedback to be. So this is the feedback that says, as the planet warms, you lose snow and ice. You lose snow and ice, the planet gets darker. The planet gets darker, it warms a bit more. So this is a positive feedback strength here. And you'll see the models are all over the place. You might have imagined I might imagine this was the easiest feedback to get right. You know, warm up the planet, snow melts, gets a bit darker. But even this, we don't know within a factor of, say, at least three here. The really neat thing about this is these models also predict how the seasonal cycle of snow cover varies in the northern hemisphere, and that's what we've got plotted here. <coughs> okay, so this is the short term variability, this is the long term sensitivity across the model ensemble. 
And normally what we'd say is this ensemble is so huge, this range is so huge, we just know there's an issue, we don't know how big it is. But because there's a relationship here that's quite robust, we can now take this measurement, which is measurable, and read off the sensitivity of the real system. Okay? We can get an approximation to the real sensitivity, real snow albedo feedback, and the combination of this emergent relationship between the models, between the short term and the long term, and an observation. <coughs> When I saw this, it was kind of exciting because, I mean, in a sense, as a climate modeler, you're always trying to converge on, um, on what you might think the truth is, but you have no idea what it is. And the range of models actually just leads you to often to lose faith because it doesn't get smaller. <laughs> it turns out the range here is exactly what allows you to get a handle on what the real world is. <coughs> okay. So how about chocolate forest dialect? So uh, this is a result I've spoken about for many years. This is actually from the Hadley Center's climate carbon cycle model. And what we found rather alarmingly in this particular model was that if you crank up CO2 under business as usual scenario, the forest is fine until the middle of the 21st century. And then it basically dies of drought and hot, and hot conditions, hot dry conditions in the Amazon. Okay. When you look at other models, they don't do that. Some do it to a lesser extent. So this is what models predict the carbon stored, the extra carbon stored in the tropics, this is between 30 north and 30 south, as a function of time out to the end of this century. And if there are no climate effects on the carbon cycle, these models all accumulate loads of carbon. This is in billions of tons of carbon, petrograms or gigatons of carbon. So the average is around about, I don't know, 300, 400 billion tons of carbon. This is a carbon sink in the tropics. Then when we turned on the fact that climate change does influence processes, in the biosphere, we saw this range here. This is the model I just showed you. Accumulates carbon for a while, then loses carbon. So this is forest dieback. Yeah. Carbon being released into the, the atmosphere, accelerating climate change. All of the models have suppressed uptake because of climate change, but it varies a lot in its size. And the question is, what's the most likely um, impact of climate change on the tropics? We do this very simply by saying, uh, imagine that in this case, we can define a change in carbon storage here uh, that's proportional to the CO2 change, and we have a parameter B, which is like the fertilization effect of CO2 on plants, a uh, beta, and we use that beta in here to work out how sensitive these systems are to climate change. Okay, so we're basically interested in how gamma changes. It's a negative number. And when we plot the models here, this is what we get. So here's, here's uh, four models, uh, no, six models in the last IPCC report. These are three variants of this model here, okay? They only differ by how we represent physiological processes in tropical forests. There's a huge range of comes to that. <coughs> if you look at this, they're all negative. Put it, yeah, it's the other way up. But they vary between losing uh, 120 billion tons of carbon from the tropical land per degree of warming to I don't know, about 30, 20 or 30. Okay, so a factor of at least seven or eight. And uh, that means that we're pretty sure that carbon will be lost in the tropics because of warming alone. But we don't know whether it's kind of peanuts or catastrophic. The normal way to deal with this is to basically have a beauty contest. So you say, well, look, um, I'm going to be the model that looks most like the real world in some way. And like all beauty contests, that's a very subjective thing. What do you think is beautiful? And each modeler will assume that what is beautiful is the thing that their model does best. <laughs> um, a colleague of mine at uh, the Marine Laboratory um, describes this as putting uh, lipstick on a pig. I mean, basically, <laughs> it's still a pig. Um, this is, um, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute, not the colleague. Okay. <laughs> This is uh, the climate impact gamma then from all these models. We might say, for example, I'm only going to believe models that have reasonable initial carbon. So if they don't have a tropical forest, I'm not going to believe them. So models down here, for example. Uh, but then if you plot this out, this is the thing we want to know the sensitivity. This is our metric of beauty. There's no relationship. There is no real reason why we should expect some arbitrarily chosen factor about the real world, like <coughs> global mean temperature to be related to sensitivity. And so people often say, well, what else can we do? Well, the thing is the models tell us. The models tell us 
What's the relationship between the things we can measure now and the sensitivities we want to know? Okay, so this is the, um, the, uh, the argument for making uh, value evaluation more than a beauty contest. And here is the, um, <laughs> the little common pig, right? So this is, this is model tuning in a sense. Imagine you take a pig, you try to make it look beautiful by tuning it to get that metric right. You won't have improved the sensitivity. You won't make it more predictive. You just make it slightly prettier. Well, that's arguable. <laughs> um, okay. So we, uh, we tried to do this through a different approach, using this idea of variability. It's a paper we published in Nature about two months ago now. Okay. And the rationale we used was that we know the growth factor of CO2. I'll show you to them all a lower record. If I were to detrend that, you'd see the CO2 growth rate vary massively from year to year. And it varies because the tropical forests particularly are responding to variability in the climate. This is, um, this is from the Global Carbon Project. Here are our emissions in petrograms of carbon. They're actually not got a lot of variability in them. They go down a bit during a recession. They generally go up, driving the increase in CO2. If you look at the CO2 growth rate, it's much more spiky. Mm. That's this blue curve here. The difference between these two, the land and ocean sinks. So the reason our CO2 isn't going up in the atmosphere as fast as this is because some fraction of it, about 50%, is being absorbed collectively by the uh, ocean and the land. So the variability here in that sea is all to do with the tropical ecosystems. Okay? And for many years we thought, this must be telling us something useful. And we just couldn't quite work out what it was. In fact, we got a bit greedy with this information such that we weren't able to use it properly. But it's actually telling us just about the tropics. The other thing we know is the variability is very much dominated by the land. So the variability in this case gives us the thing we most want to know is how sensitive are tropical ecosystems to climate. Okay. Um, so say so we take that record. This is actually the global CO2 record now in the black. This is the CO2 growth rate from year to year. Now you see it go up and down a lot. There's huge peaks, for example. This is the big El Nino of 98. Um, this was the response to Pinatubo. A tube of volcano. Generally speaking, though, it doesn't look like a good correlation, but this is a useful correlation between the anomaly in tropical temperature and the anomaly in the CO2 growth rate. And this is just observations, right? So we can use this to define a short term sensitivity to CO2 growth rate to the <coughs> temperature. I've taken out the years, the red years directly after volcanoes here. Because here there are other things going on, like diffuse light effects. But the, the straight line here is usefully constrained. The CO2 growth rate is larger by about five gigatons per year, or two and a half parts per million per year, per degree warming in the tropics. They say, well, all right, who cares? That's the short-term variability, it's not the long-term sensitivity. And that's true. But models also simulate this and they simulate the long-term sensitivity. So we can use those models to find a relationship between the short-term and the long-term, and then use the observation to tell us what is the likely long-term sensitivity. And that's what we mean by an emergent constraint. Okay, now when we do this, we do exactly the same thing with the models. This is what we found for the sensitivity of the CO2 growth rate, and there isn't much difference between these two plots. Now notice that the units are different because this is a rate of change. Um, there was no... <coughs> direct a priori reason why this would work so well. Some people said you've just been lucky, and I just said, well, I, that's not going to stop me publishing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just do it quicker. Um, so the, the neat thing about this is we've got a relationship from the models between the long term and the short term that is robust. The models, we don't believe any of them in terms of the numbers they get, necessarily. But because we've got a short term variable here, and we've got an observation of that, we essentially have a constraint on this which implies a constraint on this. Okay? As long as you believe the models aren't all misleading you in exactly the same way. That's the caveat. And I have enough faith in models to believe that's not the case. Okay, so in the case of possible dieback of tropical forests, we find a relationship between the predicted loss of tropical land carbon under warming and the model sensitivity of the annual growth rate of CO2 to tropical tension on That's a bit of a mouthful, but basically, we can look at the CO2 record we've already got, we look at the temperature record we've already got, and we can work out this second thing, 
and the models tell us how they relate that to the sensitivity. And this is what it looks like for the five models we use to fit. So here's the, here's the thing we want to know, here's the thing we can measure. And those three models I showed you at the end, which were different variants of model A, which had the dieback, we used this as a test of this relationship. And bizarrely, they were almost perfectly predicted by it. Okay, so not just is, does this look robust in the sense of being a good straight line, it looks like you can extrapolate to some extent with it too. So we were pretty excited when we saw that. But the really interesting thing is we've now got a constraint on the short-term variability of the observations and the models together, collectively, tell us how to relate that to the sensitivity of the system. Okay. What it means is you can work out from how good this straight line fit is and how well you know this constraint, you can work out what the likely probability density function is for the, for the sensitivity you're interested in. So this is what we'd get for the climate impact if we didn't constrain it. Basically, we'd have some very large ones where the forest dies, some even positive ones where we might say there's a small chance that climate change will be beneficial for tropical forests. When we put that constraint in, we tighten up a lot. We uh, now almost rule out a very significant dieback here, and we almost completely rule out the chance that climate change is good news. In fact, we're pretty tight around the minus 50. Still a big number. That's 50 billion tons of carbon loss per degree of warming. In these models, that's more than counteracted by the CO2 effect on growth through fertilization. So in this generation of models, this actually implies the forest will be fine, as long as we don't chop them down first. Okay, this is where the CO2 driven dieback die was, so we can almost rule it out. So the combination of these two things, the relationship in the model plus the, plus the observation, gives us a constraint on this carbon loss from the forest, it's minus 52 plus or minus 17. Exactly. Um, right. And that means that CO2 driven tropical forest dieback is very unlikely. But the big if here is if CO2 fertilization in the tropics is as large as current models suggest. So essentially, current models are this fight between CO2 enhancing growth through fertilization and, and climate change associated with CO2 tending to reduce carbon storage on the land. And there's a tug of war between the two. We think we, we now know the direct climate bit. What we don't know, I don't think very well, is the CO2 fertilization effect in the tropics. If, for example, CO2 fertilization is saturated, we would actually see this as our net change for every warming after that. Okay? Or, if climate change was due to something other than CO2, it was related to methane or aerosol changes, for example. Okay. Oh, I'm actually finished, Sue. Um, so, I mean, I, this is a sort of specific case of this idea of an emergent constraint, but I'm really, really excited about the idea that these are all over the place. That is the idea that we use models that are imperfect but consistent, internally consistent, to work out relations between the sensitivity we want to know and the things we can, in principle, measure in the real world. In other words, you're using variability to get the sensitivity. And um, I think I'm done. Yeah, okay, thank you very much.